and gentlemen, welcome on the beta stage of the fourth Baltic MSP Forum. My name is uh, Artis Wazolinj and I will be your stage host here in Latvia, but we are working fully online today as uh, we're going to conduct workshop number nine. Yesterday we talked about the heritage aspects of marine culture and also about sustainable multi-use and blue economy. And today, on the second day of the forum, uh, we're having workshop number nine, uh, which is about MSP and climate change from theory to practice in the Baltic Sea region. Before I hand it over to the content moderator, uh, there are a few technical things I would like to go over. First of all, please, dear viewers, do publish your uh, photos in the virtual corner. The link to the photo corner can be found in the comment section on the right-hand side of the screen. And afterwards, your photos will be put together in a beautiful collage. And all these uh, collages will be sent out to you. So give us your photo and we will give you something beautiful back in return. And uh, while we're at it, uh, on the right hand side is the comment and poll section. There are a few tabs on the top, just like an internet browser. In the first tab, you will see the comment section. And in the comment section, please leave your thoughts, your opinions on the topics that are discussed here in the workshop number nine. And also leave your questions. Don't uh, hold your questions back write them in instantly so that at any given point our content moderator uh, has the chance to look at them maybe ask some of them to the speakers or at the end in the q a section and uh, from time to time there will be a poll announced a question to you uh, with uh, possible given answers that uh, the speakers will use during this session, and that can be found in the second tab on the right-hand side of the screen. Uh, so do use that as uh, your ideas and thoughts will be used throughout this workshop. All right, let's uh, turn to our content moderator. She's an assistant researcher and lecturer at the University of Lisbon and an invited researcher and lecturer at Nova School of Business and Economics in Portugal. She's been conducting research on marine spatial planning and ocean sustainability for over a decade. And for the past five years has been focusing on the links between MSP and climate change. It is my honor to hand over the session to Dr. Katrina Frazao Santos. Katrina, the next hour and a half is in your disposal. Good morning, everyone, and thank you so much, Artis, for the kind introduction. Uh, welcome to Workshop 9 on Marine Special Planning and Climate Change from Theory to Practice in the Baltic Sea Region. Um, so as Artis said, uh, climate change is really a challenge to marine special planning, and I have been dedicating some time to this hot topic. Uh, so Climate induced changes uh, in ocean conditions and marine ecosystem structure and functioning, and this will lead to changes in the distribution and intensity of uh, ocean related uh, human uses. And this will lead to new conflicts between uses, new, new pressures on the environment, and also legal issues. And all of these are at the core of marine special planning. And for that reason, marine special planning needs to incorporate these challenges and dynamics to be sustainable in the long term. And this has been a, a, a topic that is getting more and more attention around the globe. And today we will hear about these challenges and solutions uh, in the Baltic Sea region. So the agenda for our workshop today includes five presentations. We will start with national marine special planning experiences from Sweden and Denmark. Um, by uh, Joachim Hoenten and uh, Henrik Skovmark, respectively. Then we will hear Marcus Miner on climate change in the Baltic Sea and the Earth Expert Network on climate change. Then Jonas Paulsen will talk about the assessment of climate change impacts and the Climbering Project. And finally, Oscar Tornquist will address climate refugia in the Baltic Sea and the, Bal the Pan-Baltic Scope Project. We will also have, as Arti said, two moments with polls throughout the workshop and also a question and answer session after presentations. So I strongly invite you to pose your questions 
using the comments box during the presentations. Uh, and you also may identify the speaker that they are addressed to if you want to, and we will get to them at the Q&A session. So with no further ado, we will first hear from Joachim Johansson on the exper experiences from Swedish MS Marine Spatial Planning. Joachim is a senior analyst at the Swedish Agency for Marine and Water Management, working with MSP since 2011, so a decade now. He's co-chair of the Vahelkam Vazab MSP Working Group. He is the Swedish delegate in the EU Member States Expert Group on MSP and National Contact Point for EU-funded Pan Baltic Scope and Capacity for MSP projects. And he holds over 20 years of experience in public administration. So Joaquin, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Katarina. Well, uh, first I have to say that uh, it should have been Ella Silik, my colleague, who, who should have made this uh, presentation, but unfortunately she's not able to attend. So I will do it instead of her. Uh, and before going into the uh, actual topic, the uh, climate change aspects in, in our process, I will say a few words about the state of play of the Swedish planning. Uh, we, uh, my agency, the Swedish Agency for Marine and Water Management, submitted a plan proposal to the government in December 2019. And the government is still preparing the plans for adoption, uh, and hopefully there will be an adoption soon. Meanwhile, uh, our agency uh, and the government administration is preparing for their publication and their application. Uh, SWAM, is, SWAM, that's my organization, is also elaborating a framework for monitoring and follow-up. And that will be out for consultation once the adoption of the plans have been made by the government. That was the background. Now I will turn to the... Yes. Uh, now we go back to the climate change uh, aspects. Well, actually, in, in our current status report in 2014 already, uh, we made some conclusions in relation to uh, climate change. First one was that MSP must relate to climate change. And that is, of course, because climate change will impact the seas and opportunities to use the sea, and that's quite obvious. We also concluded that knowledge on climate change must be incorporated, uh, like all other knowledge, and it also has to be the best up-to-date knowledge. And also finally, and that's really important, that MSP actually can contribute to both mitigation and adaption and resilience. Uh, so that was the points of departure for our process, as stated in, in, in our current report in 2014. Well, we also did a, a very first baseline analysis, a kind of initial analysis uh, presented in this Status report. And for each sector uh, and interest, uh, we made an analysis uh, uh, from different, on different perspectives uh, related to the sectors and interests. And uh, one, of course, was uh, climate change uh, impact and also how the sectors relate to mitigation and adaption and also the needs for, for adaption. So we have that kind of information for, for each one of them. Here we have two examples, that's defense and energy. And for example, for defense, we said that the climate change can lead to uh, development of conflicts and create unrest in the region uh, in, the, in the long run. It's one example of inclusion we made. Uh, that, however, did not affect our planning as such, but it was just, just an example of what kind of conclusions we draw quite early, early on in our process. Well, uh, from that, uh, we also concluded that climate change and climate change aspect of, is really a cross-cutting issue. You have it like everywhere in your planning pro process and it has to follow you all the way till the end, until you have the plans in place and also when it comes to implementation application of the plans. But we also came to the conclusion that we should focus on offshore wind uh, for mitigation. Uh, and also that biodiversity, of course, is essential uh, when it comes to adaption and resilience. Uh, and also a very small issue in our plants, but it's there, that sand extraction. Uh, they can also be part of this uh, adaptation measures, uh, even though it's, it's sometimes highly debated, but it's there. 
As for other sectors like fisheries and shipping, uh, of course, they are affected by climate change as, as the biodiversity, as the ecosystem is changing. But it's difficult to predict the special consequences, uh, also making it very difficult to translate into specific, specific planning solutions. So actually, there we didn't do much in our planning, but that's something that will come back, I, I guess, in the future. Well, uh, here we have uh, one plan, uh, as I said, submitted in 2019. This is planned for the Baltic Sea or the Baltic Sea proper. And we have three plans, uh, one for the Botnian uh, Bay, one for the Baltic Sea, and one for Kattegat and Skagrak uh, by the west coast of Sweden. And the city you see behind me uh, is located in, this, uh, in, 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 uh, in Skagrak on the west coast of Sweden. Uh, and we have included the classical uses in our plants, like energy extraction, defense, uh, nature. We also have fisheries, which is not so common, but I think might be more common in, in future when there are more, uh, uh, more demand for space and there are more competition between users. So, uh, well, uh, first I will start with offshore wind. Uh, Initially, it was not a, a, a very prioritized uh, uh, use, but it became more and more important as time went by. Uh, and in the end, we had an ambition of uh, making a plan that could facilitate the, a, an annual production of 50 terawatt hours. Uh, maybe that's it's difficult to relate to that, but uh, the total switch consumption, the yearly consumption is about 140 terawatt hours. So it, it's substantial. Uh, however, uh, we met a number of conflicts uh, in the current management and planning system. Uh, and uh, we had conflicts with nature conservation, of course, because normally the places for offshore wind, uh, good for offshore wind, are also good for, 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 for certain species. And also we have huge conflicts with defense interests, in particular in the Baltic Sea. So the, the result of the planning exercise was that we, uh, we estimate that we can reach 20 to 30 terawatt hours if at least half of the areas we have in our plan are used for offshore wind. That means installation of six, six to eight gigawatts. But uh, the plans are not yet adopted, uh, but already there was uh, quite recently uh, an article uh, written by the Minister of uh, Environment, also part of the leader of the Green Party in Sweden, and they actually asked for three times more uh, offshore wind in, 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 in our plants. So we will see what will happen with, with the decision on the plants and with, with the adoption. If that will have some kind of impact on that, I don't know. But they were asking for three times more. So that will be a challenge if that will be, 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 be made uh, in, in another planning round later on. So. Uh, then, of course, biodiversity. Biodiversity is essential, and also said by you, Katerina, uh, we have changes in the ecosystem that will have consequences. And so, ambition was to protect and improve biodiversity to strengthen the resilience, uh, because we believe that that is, is, is really important. And uh, well, uh, the result uh, in the plan maps was for five areas designated for nature. Uh, these areas are already MPAs or plan to be MPAs or natural interest areas for nature. But we also identify 38 areas uh, with uh, high nature values, uh, adding to that system. Uh, areas that are not protected today, may be protected in the future or may not. It depends on, depends on, 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 uh, on the marine environment management later on. But here we also included something called a climate refuge, and I will come back to that soon. Uh, and also, in some cases, of course, we made priorities between different users, and in some cases, nature will give explicit priority over offshore wind. Uh, in some cases, so here you see there could also be conflicts between these uh, these issues. Biodiversity, on the one hand, is important; on the other hand, we need uh, offshore wind for mitigation. And sometimes there are conflicts that have to be solved. Well, uh, then we have sand extraction, not very much. And in Sweden, it's, it's quite controversial. Uh, it's a very controversial issue. However, uh, we have included five areas for, offshore, uh, for, for sand extraction in Swedish waters. There is one existing and then four, four new ones. And of course, sand can be used for beach replenishment. Uh, and there is a demand uh, among some municipalities uh, by the south coast of Sweden. That's, of course, is also highly debated whether that should be done or not. 
may, does it make sense to, re, to constantly replenish the beaches or shall we just accept that there is a change? Uh, but our satisfaction is not only for beaches replenishment, it's also for construction, uh, because there's a lack of uh, construction sand and gravel uh, from, uh, from terrestrial areas. So, uh, I said I would, would come back to climate refugia. Well, uh, Oscar will later today, he will tell you all about that. Uh, he's an expert and, and they have worked much more than we have uh, on, on climate refugia. But for us, it's an area important for the preservation of certain species of time, despite the climate change. Uh, and that might be areas that are not so important today, but will be in the future ecosystem, these areas will be important for certain species. And we actually identify seven areas in the Baltic Sea, uh, one area important for herring, uh, five areas with uh, blue mussels that is important in the food web as food for other species, like birds. Uh, and then there is an area with several uh, species like herring, blue mussel and bladder rack, uh, uh, which is kind of algae. Uh, and I would say it's, uh, I'm quite proud of this. Uh, it was quite brave because here uh, we lack, uh, there, there's still a need for, for more research, more scientific research and more thinking how we shall think about this climate refugia. Uh, and we can say that this is, is, is early work. And I think it's, as far as I know, it's the only plan in Europe having added something called climate refugia, uh, something explicit as climate refugia. On the other hand, as I said, if we protect the biodiversity, we will also protect the future climate refugia, probably. So this is kind of the top of the biodiversity, uh, <laughs> the little extra you can do uh, uh, in relation to climate. Uh, so my concluding remarks, uh, I cannot repeat it too many times, biodiversity, biodiversity, biodiversity. If you work well there, uh, you will also be better prepared for the future even in the future you don't know everything about. So, so, so really uh, to apply an ecosystem approach, that's really uh, basics when it comes to climate change. And as I said again, more research is needed for climate, for the climate exclusion concept, uh, and that's coming around the world, but we need more uh, in relation to MSP, we think. And we hope that this area will, will persist in the plan once, also in the adopted plans by the government, because that will be very important. Uh, and then finally, uh, when it comes to renewable uh, energy, uh, it's cer certainly they can bring climate benefits, uh, but to what extent really depends on the natural situation and the time perspective, because we did this uh, sustainability assessments to try to calculate the benefits. And that's, that's tricky, because in Europe, we have this uh, EU uh, emission trading system, meaning that you can uh, by increasing the renewable energy, you can also increase other types of bad energy. That's one thing. And also it depends on, on the natural situation. Uh, for example, in Sweden, uh, some nuclear plants have been closed. And of course, if offshore wind is replacing the nuclear plants, you will not have these huge benefits, even though there will be benefits when it comes to, to emissions. So it really depends, uh, but I still think uh, in, in the long run and in this very global picture, of course, renewable energy is extremely important uh, uh, um, for mitigation. Uh, but I just want to highlight that it's, it's not that straightforward always when you start to calculate and, and see the figures. Uh, so I think that was my, my last slide. So I, I stopped there, thank you. Thank you, Joachim, for such an interesting presentation. And I have to say that I love the, the sentence on biodiversity, 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 because I also agree that if we get that right, we have half of our problems uh, well addressed. Um, so I kindly remind the participants that you can use the, the comments box and add your questions there to Joaquin, and then we will address them all during the question and answer session at the end of the workshop. And we will now hear from Herring uh, Skovmark, who will talk about marine social planning in Denmark and renewable energy as a tool to meet climate change. Henrik is Chief Special Advisor at Danish Maritime Authority, and he has led the work with the first Danish Marine Special Plan for the past three years. 
So Henrik, the floor is yours. Thank you, Katarina, and uh, thank you for the invitation and the possibility to participate today. My name is Henrik Skomark, and I'm a Chief Special Advisor at the Danish Maritime Authority. Um, I will also start with uh, a little bit of, of background. We have sent our MSP into public consultation for six months by uh, the end of March uh, this year. Uh, the MSP is legally binding while in consultation and we uh, expect the adopted MSP to enter into force by uh, the end of this year. I will give you a, a quick run through the Danish MSP today and focus on how we use um, renewable energy and nature protection as tools to meet uh, climate change. Um, the Danish MSP sets uh, the overall planning framework for the energy sector at sea, maritime transport, transport infrastructure, aquaculture, extraction of raw materials at sea, land recovery, as well as protection of the environment. The Danish MSP reflects uh, the Danish political agreement on offshore wind and for oil and gas in the North Sea as well as the Danish government's draft for new nature reserves. Um, the MSP is digital, and as I said, it's legally binding for Danish authorities who will have to grant licenses in accordance uh, with the MSP. Uh, the digital MSP is available in both Danish and English, and it will hopefully make it easy for citizens, companies, and authorities to see which areas have been allocated for which purposes and what the legal effect of an allocation is. You can use the digital MSP a bit like Google, Google Maps and zoom in on the areas you're interested in. And you can also export the MSP as WMS or WFS services and use it in your own desktop GIS program. I will, due to uh, the topic of today's workshop, focus on the sectors in the Danish MSP that assist the aim of meeting climate change and of reaching the green goals by both the Danish parliament and uh, the EU. Um, Denmark support EU's offshore strategy, and uh, we have set ambitious goals for the green uh, transition. The development of green technologies at sea is a key tool to achieve these goals. In the Danish MSP, we have therefore designated more than 15% of Denmark's total sea area to renewable energy sources. This will contribute to Denmark being able to comply with the Paris Agreement on the reduction of greenhouse gases and achieve the target of 70% CO2 reduction in 2030 and climate neutrality in 2050. Denmark becomes the first country in the world to begin construction of two artificial energy islands, one in the North Sea and one in the Baltic Sea near the Isle of Bornholm. The energy islands will have a total capacity of five gigawatt and are scheduled for completion by 2030. Denmark has also decided to accelerate other projects to a total of six gigawatt offshore wind or more than three times Denmark's current capacity. In addition to generating electricity for consumption, the energy from the islands will eventually be utilized in power to X technologies that can store or convert green el electricity into green fuels. The Danish political agreement includes a tender to support the establishment of large-scale power to X plants with a total capacity of 100 megawatt. This is more than five times the capacity of the largest plants found in the world today. The MSP sets the overall framework for long-term expansion of renewable energy at sea as demands increases in the transport sector, in the industry and in the society in general. The Danish MSP continues the existing oil and gas area in the Danish North Sea. 
What a political agreement on this matter from December last year means that oil and gas extraction in Denmark will cease no later than in 2050, and that Denmark cancels all future rounds of tendering. In order to remove CO2 from the atmosphere, the Danish government has also decided that it shall be possible to capture and store CO2 in the Danish seabed, seabed in the same part of the North Sea. In parallel with the MSP consultation, the Danish government has sent 13 new nature protected areas at sea into consultation. These areas will follow up on the obligation in the Marine Strategy Directive. The government has proposed strict protection in 12 of the 13 areas. Five of these areas are located in the Baltic Sea near the Isle of Bornholm, as you can see on the map. In addition, the government has proposed the designation of six new bird protection areas as well. These are the spotted areas on the map, and one is located in the Baltic Sea, southwest of Unholm. With these new nature protected areas, the total share of Danish protected sea area increases from 19 to 30 percent of Denmark's total sea area and contributes to achieve a good environmental condition in the areas for marine plants and animals and restoring biodiversity. That was my short introduction to the goals of the Danish MSP in relation to climate change. Thank you. Thank you so much, Henrik, for this present presentation on how uh, Denmark is addressing this very important topic. Um, so now we have our first two polls and you can go to, you have to switch from the comments to the polls tab on your, on the right side of uh, your screen. And the first question for all of the participants and speakers, if you want to, is in your opinion, is climate change a major challenge for marine spatial planning in the Baltic region? And answers can range in a scale from one to five, where one means not at all, not at all uh, relevant, and five very much relevant as a, cha a challenge. So if all of you want to participate, it will, it's very nice to have the opinions and the perception of, of participants. So far, we have number four with 50% of the responses. So we'll just wait for a little bit more time to see if we get more participations. It is nice to see that no one replied, not at all. <laughs> so there is a, a uh, ongoing recognition of the relevance of climate change as a challenge, and this is very important. And now we can move to the second poll. And the second question for you is, is it urgent to develop marine special planning initiatives? Just wait for a moment to see the second poll. Okay, is it urgent to develop marine special planning initiatives that properly integrate the climate change dimension? And again, your answers can range from not at all to very much. And the tendency uh, is that, yes, four and five, so these, uh, Together, they get over 80% of the replies. And this means that, yes, you, you agree that it, we need to start developing these marine spatial planning in initiatives that integrate climate change properly. Thank you so much for contributing to this. Okay, so we move on to our next speaker. And now we have Marcus Meyer who will introduce the climate change fact sheet of Alcom Baltic Earth 
and we'll give a few selected examples of projected changes. So Marcus is a professor and head of the Physical Oceanography and Instrumentation Department at the Leibniz Institute for Baltic Sea Research. He's a senior scientist at the Oceanographic Research Unit of the Swedish Meteorological and Hydrological Institute and co-chair of the Helcom Baltic Earth Expert Network on Climate Change, EEM CLIM. For the past three decades, Marcus has worked with regional climate and environmental research with focus on the Baltic Sea, North Sea, Laptev Sea, and Pan Arctic Ocean. So, Marcus, the floor is yours. Good morning, everybody, and thank you very much, Katerina, for this nice introduction, and thank you for um, inviting me here to this uh, workshop. I will tell you a little bit about the knowledge base that is uh, provided uh, to Helcom and other stages from uh, scientists. And uh, it can, of course, be debated, but for the Baltic Sea as a whole, one of the biggest problems is the dead sea bottoms. So the large oxygen depletion that we find in the deep water. And uh, uh, this is one of the main issues that uh, Helcom has addressed since uh, uh, decades. So you see here the uh, records of uh, hypoxic area that, that are these dead uh, sea bottoms. In black, it's uh, reconstruction, uh, reconstructions in um, uh, yellow. You can see here the results of several climate models and the curve actually shows the median of that. And that is the uh, situation about today. And uh, um, uh, Helcom and has asked scientists what will happen in, in the future. And from that, the Baltic Sea Action Plan has been developed. But the Baltic Sea Action Plan has been developed uh, on present climate. So the question was in the past and has been debated very much, what will be uh, the additional impact uh, when you reduce uh, from climate and how much will climate change counteract the efforts made by the Baltic Sea Action Plan? Uh, and here now, uh, uh, Helcom has a concrete question to science, and science uh, uh, in the Baltic Sea is organized within the scientific network Baltic Earth. And uh, Baltic Earth is uh, uh, yeah, not an independent scientific organization um, organizing workshops and uh, um, conferences, but also assessments. And the assessment means that there is an uh, overview given, uh, like uh, in the IPCC reports worldwide, what will happen uh, with climate change for the Baltic Sea. The first assessment that Baltic Earth uh, organized uh, 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 at that time, actually in 2008, the name of Baltic Earth was still Baltics. Uh, Baltics started in, in the 90s. Uh, uh, was the back author team uh, book in, in 2008. <clears throat> and um, uh, then there was a second update in 2015. And now presently we are uh, working with a, a new update, a new assessment. We call it now BEARS, the Baltic Earth Assessment Reports. And they are due, um, well, they are submitted uh, now in form of special articles to uh, uh, a special issue in Earth System Dynamics, so peer-reviewed articles, 10 uh, articles actually, and uh, quite, uh, some of them are quite uh, comprehensive. Uh, that means some hundred pages or, or so. So a lot of material that has been provided by science for uh, stakeholders. And therefore there is, uh, was this long going uh, collaboration with Helcom that already from the very first book in 2008, Helcom produced the, an own uh, report uh, of climate change, uh, translating the comprehensive uh, huge material into um, information for stakeholders. And uh, I should uh, uh, say here actually, <coughs> sorry, uh, that these uh, um, um, assessments are built on consensus and dissensus. So this is not that this is just a review of the literature that we know uh, about the impacts of climate change. It is also an assessment in the sense that it is uh, weighted if there is a consensus about scientists 
or a dissensus. So for instance, if there are two papers stating of opposite uh, uh, messages, then this is written down, not hidden. That is the basic principle on these assessment reports. And I think that's uh, very important. Um, so we go on. Uh, actually, the format uh, has now changed how Helcom, uh, together with Biobotic Earth, translate this information into uh, stakeholder information. It's not a report anymore. It was now decided to have a climate change fact sheet. The climate fact sheet uh, was produced by a group called NCLIM, the expert network of, uh, cl uh, on climate change. It uh, includes some background information. It includes a map showing regional future climate changes for selected parameters under um, the greenhouse gas emission scenarios RCP 4.5. It uh, uh, gives information about 34 parameters that we call them direct or indirect parameters. Direct means that is uh, directly affected by climate change. Indirect uh, are then um, uh, um, depending on the direct parameters. For each of the parameters in the fact sheet, there's a brief description, past and future changes, knowledge gaps, policy relevance and references. And the reference um, base is actually the scientific literature, in this case, the bears the Baltic Earth uh, assessment reports. More than 110 scientists from all of the Baltic Sea countries contributed. So that was a really success that we have uh, so many uh, support supporters to th this work. Uh, the work started at the end of uh, 2000 and well, it was launched in 2018 and uh, started in 2019. And the publication is now planned for September uh, 2020. 22 or 21 so this year and um, uh, here you see an overview what is in the fact sheet or what will be in the fact sheet it is not uh, finalized yet um, the direct uh, parameters for instance are air temperature water temperature sea ice and so on and they are grouped in different uh, groups under the energy cycle water cycle carbon and nutrient cycles sea level and wind or momentum um, uh, cycle and the indirect parameters and are then the dependent ones uh, for instance oxygen the microbes, microbial communities, processes, benthic habitats, and so on, fish, marine uh, mammals, water birds, under biota uh, and ecosystem groups. Then, uh, but also then uh, human activities, coastal protection, offshore wind farms, and so on, and services, blue carbon storage capacity or marine coastal ecosystem services. You will recognize that the list is, of course, not complete. 34 is rather limited, but uh, actually it uh, was not possible in the time that we had to address all the parameters. And it is planned to have this fact sheet um, therefore regularly. So in a few day, uh, years time, there will be an update and then hopefully based on the response that we are getting, there will be also other parameters addressed that we do not have in the list today. So briefly, what is the uh, basis? And the basis is the uh, assessments, uh, what I said, but here, uh, and these are based on the uh, scientific literature. What can we expect for the uh, Baltic Sea in the future? The upper panels show air temperature changes for winter and summer and the lower precipitation changes. And uh, uh, from left to right, you see uh, uh, different uh, greenhouse gas emission scenarios from the Paris Agreement, that's the RCP 2.6, to the warmer uh, and, and perhaps unrealistic RCP 8.5. What is striking, independent of the season, the Baltic Sea is warming less than the surrounding uh, land. The largest warming you find in the wintertime in the, in the northeast. In, uh, for precipitation, there is an overall uh, wettening, uh, actually. It is less clear uh, for summer in the south. There are uh, uh, uncertainties in the uh, models as well, and the signal is rather faint. But we expect that overall there is a wettening in, in the region. Uh, uh, very important are also climate extremes for the ecosystem. And here I give you one example. 
uh, these are so-called tropical nights. And tropical nights are defined as days where the minimum temperature does not fall below 20 degrees. So people like to make their holidays at the shores uh, of the Baltic Sea because of the moderate climate. But in the future, we expect here actually the largest, largest changes uh, concerning um, um, uh, these tropical nights. Uh, because you see clearly that, of, um, that uh, uh, in addition to Southern Europe, the Baltic Sea is a hotspot of the changes. And now back to my introduction uh, slide, uh, hypoxic area. Uh, here we have produced now, with the help of models, um, the different projections for the future, including climate change. So the Baltic Sea Action Plan is actually the red curve, but then there are also other nutrient loads that have been combined with the different um, uh, uh, greenhouse gas emission scenarios. The reference one in blue and the worst case in um, uh, pink. And uh, uh, what you can see clearly that despite of the counteracting effect of climate change, uh, there is an improvement implementing, fully implementing. These are idealized. I mean, assuming really the numbers from the uh, from Helcom, that the ecosystem state uh, will uh, definitely improve. It might not uh, get the same. Uh, um, um, uh, the same improvement as in the uh, as without uh, climate warming, but uh, um, there is a clear improvement. So uh, the message here is, if there is a successful implementation of the Baltic Sea Action Plan, it will help despite of the climate change. So I give you a few selected results now at the end uh, from the fact sheet. Uh, and uh, I, due to the time constraints, I have only five. So the first one is about sea surface temperature. Uh, it is projected to increase, and here it's really an average about several uh, uh, over several models and uh, over the entire sea surface uh, from 1.1, that is the RCP 2.6, so the Paris Agreement to 3.2. That's the worst case, ACP 8.5 by the end of this century. Uh, in addition, the maximum sea ice extent or the sea ice cover will further decrease. During the past two decades, it has been observed that the uh, ice cover uh, decreased. There are no severe uh, winters anymore. But now uh, the projections suggest that the Botnian Sea on average will be ice free at the end of the century. Number three, due to the large uncertainty in projected freshwater supply from the catchment area, wind and global sea level rise, salinity projections show a widespread trend and no robust changes were identified. And that is compared, uh, that is a relatively new information uh, based on more models that we have uh, pr produced than in earlier times. So the message that has been around that salinity will necessarily decrease is not correct anymore and should be included then in the MSP. For acidification, it's a little bit tricky because it depends not only on the atmospheric uh, partial pressure, but also on alkalinity. In the past, it, alkalinity has increased and counteracted uh, pH. So the acidification in the Baltic Sea was uh, always lower than in, on the world ocean. We do not know how this evolved, but uh, doubling of uh, PCO2 will still result in a lower uh, pH or uh, in an increased acidity. Acidification. And finally, the implementation of the Baltic Sea Action Plan will lead to a significantly improved deep water oxygen conditions, irrespectively um, of the uh, irrespective of the climate projection used. Thank you for your attention. And sorry, uh, no, I can't move the slide. But now I hope. I would like to thank you for your attention, but also the NCLIM author team, all the uh, different people that have contributed with many, many hours of work and with many, many discussions to uh, about each of the sentences, uh, because it was sometimes really a big task uh, to agree on a, a statement of consensus. And if that was not possible, uh, it was highlighted as a dissensus statement. So thank you so much. 
Thank you, Marcus, for, for such informative and interesting presentation. Um, to all participants with questions to Marcus, please add them to the comments box, box and they will be addressed during Q&A. Uh, we now have um, our third and fourth polls. And if, we, if you go, you need to switch to the polls tab. And the first question that we have is, can marine spatial planning contribute to climate adaptation? That is adjusting to climate impacts in order to minimize harm and explore beneficial opportunities. And again, answers can range from one, not at all, to five, very much. Okay, and we already have few answers here with 40% of participants agreeing that it's very much important and can very much contribute or and 30% on, on number four, which is very good. So marine spatial planning can indeed contribute to climate adaptation through a number of pathways. And the, the other poll that we have, the other question is, can marine spatial planning contribute to climate mitigation, that is decreasing emissions of greenhouse gases? I would wait just for a bit, but it seems that everyone agrees that yes, it can contribute very much to this. And if anyone wants to expand their uh, replies on why this is, why do you think this way, you can use the comment box as well to do so. Okay. Let me just check, yes. Okay, thank you so much. So we will now hear from Jonas Paulsen, our next speaker, on the assessment of environmental impacts of climate change and the Climarine project. So Jonas is a senior analyst at the Swedish Agency for Marine and Water Management. He's vice chair and head of the delegation for Sweden at OSPAR's expert committee on environmental impacts and human activities and co-chair of Helcom's EN Climb. So he's currently working with marine environmental impact on human activities and cumulative environmental impact assessment via the Symphony tool. He has a master's degree in marine biology from Lund University and a PhD on oil spill preparedness from the World Maritime University. So Jonas, the floor is yours. Thank you. I hope you can hear me all right. So I will keep uh, building on um, what Marcus was presenting before. Um, we've used the uh, results of uh, the modeling in our project called Climarine, which is about marine spatial planning in a changing climate. And um, uh, yeah, we've tried to address um, different ways uh, or try to come up with some recommenda recommendations for marine spatial planners. And we've used um, the same data and uh, the, the same models from uh, Marcus. Um, and we've developed a few of these uh, maps in a more spatial manner. So with the RCP 4.5 and 8.5 for salinity. And uh, this shows a bit more uh, change than uh, Marcus was saying with um, the, um, uh, the Ian Klein climate change fact sheets. And yeah, I will have to get back to him uh, later uh, if this is very incorrect. Uh, it's still within the uncertainty parameters, but um, what we have is a, a bit more change. Uh, and for surface water temperature, uh, we have this, so slight increase in RCP 4.5 and a uh, pretty high one in 8.5. And um, for sea ice, um, of course, the change will be a lot bigger in the north for ice cover reduction. And we've 
taken these maps and imported them into Symphony. And Symphony is the marine spatial uh, planning decision support tool that we've used in the Swedish marine spatial planning when uh, when we when we designed partly when we designed the different and assigned the different areas and also when we did the environmental impact assessment for the Swedish marine spatial plan and it has um, uh, it consists of a lot of maps I don't know if you can see my pointer probably not yeah on the left um, it has a lot of pressures pressure maps from human activities about 40 of them uh, we have 34 maps of uh, in different uh, nature values or ecosystem components and these are habitats and a mix of habitats and species and then there we have a sensitivity matrix which is a, a pretty big uh, excel sheet which defines how much each pressure affects each ecosystem components uh, from zero which is no effect and up to one in a linear um, uh, linear relationship up to one which is death and permanent destruction basically and we've used these maps to calculate for each area in the swedish sea how much uh, the environmental impact is and we can also pull out some some nice uh, statistical tables on how much um, pressure each pressure contributes um, to the environmental impact and uh, what ecosystem component is being affected by the pressures. So using this system, we've imported the marine, uh, the climate change pressure uh, maps that I showed before. And uh, we've come up with maps like this. So um, on the top left, you see the West Coast uh, with only the symphony and uh, then with the climate uh, as the symphony stuff that's in there now and then uh, the more greenish map on the right is what we have with the climate change uh, added on top uh, the maps in the middle shows the baltic sea and the maps on the right shows the northern part so the botnian bay and uh, let's see if this clicker works yeah uh, and here you can see the difference so in different areas uh, where you have the the purple and the brown you can see a lot there are certain areas that have a lot more impact than other areas even if the climate change impact of course um is uh, how do you say sea wide <laughs> sea basin wide uh, and in the baltic sea there are a few areas that uh, are more affected and the same with the botnian bay um and as symphony models the environmental impact in the botnian bay to be lowest the the largest um, relative increase to current impacts is in the botnian bay um, it's about 268 percent additional marine uh, uh, environmental impact in this area due to climate change but if uh, we look at the numbers uh, it's actually on the west coast that uh, um, the actual numbers is the highest uh, per area and if we run this 8.5 scenario um, it is of course looking the same uh, just uh, very much higher on the west coast we're looking at 117 uh, percent increase in environmental impact in the Baltic Sea proper, it's uh, 129 uh, with a lot of uh, these areas showing a, a big change. And in the Botnian Bay, it's the same as well, but with even more areas being heavily affected by climate change. Um, in the, it's the same pattern here with the largest uh, relative increase uh, to existing environmental impacts in the Botnian Bay, but the largest numerical increase is in the Baltic Sea for the uh, 8.5 scenario. And uh, all of these results are coming, uh, are, are being, um, uh, yeah, we are writing up the final results and we'll publish this at the Climate uh, Climarine 
project webpage at um, uh, the lead partner SMHI uh, the, on their webpage. I can put a link later in the chat. And the main messages that we have for marine spatial planners is that the climate change impacts at the end of the century is on the same scale as all the other environmental pressures combined. So this will have a huge impact on, uh, on the marine environment for sure. Uh, regardless of the uncertainties and everything, this will be a really big deal. And all of these models, both uh, the climate change stuff and the symphony stuff is based on a lot of assumptions and has a lot of uncertainties. But uh, we have been using the best available data and the best uh, models, global models and, and the regional models to, uh, uh, to calculate these impacts. So this is by far the best we have. So even though there is a lot of uncertainties, this is um, yeah, really top science. And uh, yes, and as I say, data will be available through uh, the SMHI, our own SWAM uh, website, and these uh, um, uh, GIS layers for salinity and temperature and ice cover will also be available through Helcom uh, later this fall. And with that, I'd like to say uh, thank you, Paldis, to everybody that has been listening. Thank you, Janus, so much uh, for this very interesting presentation. Uh, this, I, I think that despite all the, all the uncertainties and assumptions that you mentioned, um, for sure that this type of, of information is key to be included in marine spatial planning and on ongoing marine spatial plans. So, and you can always update it and improve it as time goes by, but doing these initial assessments is really, really important. So thank you so much for, for sharing this with us. Um, and again, to all participants with questions to Jonas, please add them to the comments box and they will be further addressed during Q&A. And we will now hear from our last speaker, Oscar Tornquist, who will talk about climate refugia and the future distribution of key foundation species in the Baltic Sea under the Pan-Baltic Scope project. Oscar has a PhD from Solitorn University and works as a marine geologist at the Geological Survey of Sweden with mapping and modeling of Baltic habitats. His current work includes the assembly of a Baltic-wide data cube for machine learning modeling in high resolution of past, current, and future distribution of species and habitats. So Oscar, thank you for being here and the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, you hear me? Um, so I'm going to describe our experiences from the Pan Baltic Scope project and our efforts to model future ecosystem components and how these can be used in MSP. Climate data was the same as for Climarine, supplied by SMHI, and we have collaborated with Gothenburg University for the research questions. The report from Pamboltic Scope uh, with lots of maps can be found on their website. Uh, and I will here try to focus on the methods and our current improvements of the analysis. Within the PBS project, we took a different approach to that of the Swedish MSP and Symphony, as we have heard. Instead of focusing on stress from climate change, we try to assess how the ecosystem might be affected by climate change in a hundred years. After all, what good would it do to work for conservation and restoration and devise MSP plans uh, of ecological values if they have no chance of surviving in the future? We have tried to devise a method to identify areas important in the future for ecosystem values and services. And we have also uh, been focusing on the uncertainties of the methodology. In brief, we first try to model future distributions of ecosystem components, that is mainly uh, benthic habitats, but also some species, with different methods and scenarios using uh, machine learning and, and the various climate scenarios that we have 
on hand. Uh, we then get a stack of likely future distributions of the current or the important key foundation species. And this, this kind of analysis and modeling is uh, iterated until we meet the quality standards that uh, there is a coherence bit between different model runs, et cetera, so we can get some kind of quality assessment. Uh, and by combining different distribution models and adding effects from connectivity, that is uh, source and sync effects through dispersal modeling of larvae and seeds, et cetera, we get an idea of um, future hotspots or core areas and future refugia, that is the last stands on the fringe, fringe of, of the distribution. And by adding such models, we get a map of, for instance, future food production areas or, or shelter for coastal fish. So we get a uh, nice map of uh, ecosystem services. And by setting goals for restoration, mitigation, and conservation, we can produce maps that show where to avoid certain maritime activities and ecosystem disturbance to facilitate future ecosystem services. Hello. Okay. Uh, we tried this kind of modeling for a dozen key species in the Baltic and concentrated on change of temperature and salinity at the time. Uh, however, the estimated effects that we perceived owed much to change of salinity, which is a very uncertain factor, as we have heard. We also recognized that future work was needed to include nutrients and also extreme values, such as recurring heat waves. Ongoing change in climate and nutrients will affect different species in different ways. So we have need to assess both positive and negative consequences for the various species and how they can be aggregated into different kinds of ecosystem services. Um, so we are now including nutrients, sea ice extent and extreme climate stress in our models. The difference among models is profound. As an example, look at the projected distribution of blue mussels. So here's the projected distribution today of blue mussels in, in greenish yellow. Um, and if in the milder future scenario, RCP four and a half, no real uh, change can be perceived, uh, rather, the, rather an increase in several areas due to better water quality, less sea ice and higher temperatures. And given the uh, harsher future scenario, a bit more change, primarily in the central Baltic due to anoxia and uh, uh, yeah. So, but if we, to the milder scenario, add in, in, uh, include extremes, uh, that is uh, temperature stress and the uh, salinity stress from extreme periods, like the hottest summers, uh, we get a much more profound change uh, and the species are actually re retreating south. And in the harsher scenario, including extreme, that, that paints a really bleak picture for, for the blue mussels in the Baltic due to temperature stress, the spread of anoxia, and perhaps lower salinity. And we're also aiming at modeling a large number of distributions to be able to create aggregate ecosystem service maps. Um, okay. So what is the implication of this then? Well, we need to try to identify future important species and habitats and assess the combined ecosystem services of the future and identify the core areas, both central and on the fringes, the refugia, that will supply these services. Um, if implemented, this can direct planning, mitigation and restoration efforts in MSP and conservation work. We here need a system to rank areas by probable importance to account for uncertainty. So if, if, we, if we add several model runs and several uh, scenarios, we can be pretty sure that if uh, nothing seems to affect the species, that is a, a resilient area. And on the, up, on the other side, if uh, even the milder scenario predicts a, an 
effect, we could be sure that it's going to affect the species in the future. So we get a, a graded map of, of uh, change. Um, so the proposed method in short then, we model future ecosystem components, but, uh, mainly uh, benthic habitats and the habitat forming species. And combine those, we add those, we stack those to form maps of services and weighing uncertainty. They can be a service like food production or a shelter or uh, nutrient uptake. And we delineate and prioritize resilient central or last areas uh, with, a cert with certain services. That's the, the middle map there. In, that is the, that, a map of a Sostra Marina, the uh, hotspot in. in uh, the various climate scenarios in 100 years. Um, and, and if we weigh in the um, connectivity effects, we get the areas that receive a lot of, of uh, seeds and, and larvae and also can transmit to the networks. We get the strengthening of this uh, hotspot uh, concept. Uh, and we need to be realistic when working with mitigation and restoration. With the future in mind, perhaps it is realistic to stop trying to restore the eelgrass meadows or other sensitive species that are that thrive in a more marine environment. And instead, focus on conservation and restoration for the species that will dominate in the future and which perform the same kind of ecosystem services. For instance, coastal wetlands and breeding grounds for, for, for pike. Um, So oh, thank you. That was my presentation. Thank you, Oscar, very much for this final presentation that really links very well to the previous ones and to the initial one uh, mentioning the climate refugia and the relevance of mapping uh, all these changes in ecosystem services and how we need to protect uh, and preserve uh, biodiversity to ensure uh, sustainable marine spatial planning. So we will now uh, proceed to the Q&A part of the workshop and we will address the questions that were posed already by participants during the workshop on the comments uh, section box. And for those of you who haven't done it so far, and if you want to please uh, write your questions on the comments box and we will address them. Uh, now we have 20 minutes to do this. So what I will do, I will go through uh, the questions that are already posed and we can start from here. So the, final, the, the first question that we had, uh, it was during uh, um, the first presentation. It, it was from Stefan Husa, and he asked, how much resources do you need to be properly able to take climate change into a country's region's marine spatial planning process? How big a part should the climate change part be of the whole marine spatial planning process? 20%, 50% or 90%? And this could be open to all the speakers. Um, you like him? Maybe I can answer from, from our perspective. Well, uh, as I said, climate change aspects is, is, is a cross cutting issue, so it's difficult to calculate in that way. But of course, when it comes to specific actions, um, I mean, we commissioned a few reports. We had a deal or an agreement with the uh, university and they helped us, supported us to, to provide information and planning evidence for our planning. Uh, and then of course, we have also used to be in, involved in the uh, cross border projects in the Baltic Sea, the pan baltic School project. And of course, uh, my agency is also part of the, uh, the climate project. Uh, so, um, I mean, we also use that kind of external funding, but uh, I, I mean, from 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 that the management point of view is is not that much money, but I I, I guess, but uh, I, I assume from uh, you're looking at scientifically, I mean, of course, you can spend a lot of resources on on climate change aspects, but on the other hand, that that I, I assume uh, the research can also build on the existing research in in, in, in 
in memory management. But I think my my scientific colleagues are much more can, can give a better answer to that. Thank you. Hello, Katarina, I can continue. So uh, I agree completely with uh, Joachim's uh, answer uh, that maybe today uh, climate change and the overall planning is less important, but for the future, so in decades, it will get more important. So we need more resources to really find out what's going on. And that requires uh, improved models that requires more uh, yeah, investigation from science. Uh, because uh, to be honest, there are some aspects, um, uh, Oscar, I think, uh, mentioned it uh, nicely, our knowledge about changing extremes. We do not have really much knowledge yet. And to really put this in, uh, this information about changing extremes into the planning, we need more research, more research on past records. That is difficult because, uh, well, in the Baltic Sea, we have uh, a couple of very long, nice records, but it's not enough for really addressing, uh, for in the, uh, instance, heat waves and for uh, producing better models and uh, also to uh, have the uncertainty aspect in included. More models really to uh, in, uh, investigate large sets of ensembles. And that is rather time consuming and requires more resources. So I think from that perspective, uh, a lot of resources should be put to the climate, although it is maybe not today um, the most urgent uh, driver. And I agree completely. It's a multiple driver, a multiple stressor approach that we are here looking at. Thank you. Thank you, Marcus. I fully agree with what you said about uh, being a challenge for the future, but depending on how we want to take care of the future, we need to start thinking about it today. Um, does any of the other speakers want to address this question or add something? No? Okay, so we go to the next question. And here we have uh, a comment by Angela Schultz-Sedden. Blue mussels, algae cultivation, low trophic aquaculture are also important for climate mitigation as CO2 and nutrient uptake. So nature-based solutions contributing to climate change mitigation. So, and, and following this on the same topic, uh, hi Henrik, following up on my comment before, do you now see the shellfish areas designed in the Danish MSP also as a climate mitigation answer? So, who wants uh, to comment here? Maybe Henrik? Yeah, from from our perspective, the, 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 the shellfish uh, designated zones was not meant as a part of uh, mitigation climate change. But of course, um, they have that uh, expected uh, effect. But again, I, th I think maybe the scientists among us can, can, can talk more into to depth about, about that um, aspect. Okay, does anyone else want to add here? No, okay, so we go to the next question. Um, by Question and comments, we have both together. So Suzanne Altwerner, Altwerter uh, asks, the idea of climate refugia presented by Joaquin is very promising. Would it be feasible to even provide flexible zones to adapt more easily to changes on fish talk or mammal, mammal movements? Joaquin, do you want to step in here? Uh, well, I don't know if I understood the question, but uh, in, 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 in our case, uh, this area are designated as area where you should take uh, particular consideration when you want to in, in management or when you are seeking permission for something. It's also guidance for the authorities when they want to manage the, the sea and the sea environment. So that way it's quite flexible. Uh, we are not very... Uh, 
prescriptive, prescriptive uh, about what should be done, but it's more like the plan is signal will take care, uh, take it easy and, and uh, really look into the matter and, and make good decisions. So that's how it functions in, 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 in our system. And also um, knowing that this is kind of early work uh, and we also heard about the predictions, uh, there will be some changes. Uh, we don't know how much and, and when, but they will come and we, we have to act act on that. But uh, at the same time, it's, it's, it's early days, also scientifically. So uh, that's why uh, the areas we have designated are also areas that are important for other reasons. So that's how we can, can argue for them. But to give this kind of extra on the top information that is also climate refugia. And that's also a, a good way of, of communicating that there is something to be protected in the future that we might not see today. Um, when it's come to this kind of active management, if, if that was meant by the question, uh, I mean, active management that you, you, you change things at a day to day basis. I mean, that you have in fisheries. Uh, you have that within the common fisheries policy, but otherwise we can do that. But, of course, maybe in the future that could be something, I don't know. Uh, oh, oh, that's my answer. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joachim. So we have a couple more uh, questions on the Danish case study. Um, one of them is by Jonas and it says, Henrik, I think I saw a few places where bird protection and wind farms are co-located. Is that correct? Uh, if so, does Denmark think these areas are comfortable? And also uh, another question on Danish MSP by Stephen Husa. Is 2050 too late or should the deadline for oil and gas extraction be earlier to mitigate the effects of climate change? I know this is probably nothing the MSP can do, but I think we shouldn't have oil and gas targets that exceed up to 2050. Well, on the first uh, question, Yes, uh, we have some uh, cases in the Danish MSP where bird protection is and um, renewable energy is overlapping. Um, um, of, we have made an assessment of on the overall level. So it's the plan and the designated zones that has been assessed. There has to be made assessments of this specific projects uh, to get a permission to start the construction. So it's not necessarily that we will have overlap when we come to the uh, uh, to the specific projects, because uh, in regard to um, renewable energy, we are laying out zones that are much bigger than when than we need for the uh, specific. Um, uh, um, windmill parks. In, in Denmark, we designate three to four times more space. And then when we know where we will have the actual um, uh, parks, then, then we will um, uh, have free space uh, left. Um, but we have to, to look into that uh, when we uh, are constructing the actual uh, windmill parks. Another thing in, in that regard is that, that the zones are designated for renewable energy. So it's not just uh, uh, offshore wind, it could also be sea wave technologies or, or solar cells. Um, in regard to the other question, well, that's not uh, up to uh, the MSP to, uh, to decide when to stop uh, oil and gas uh, extraction. Uh, as I said, it will be no later than 2050. So maybe it will be uh, well before that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Henrik, very much. I think you also mentioned a very important thing is that MSP, although it's a very relevant tool, it's not the answer to everything and cannot address all the issues related to ocean management. Um, 
So for another question, we have a question here for Jonas. Jonas, I know that you already answered this on, on the chat, but if you want to say some words. Uh, so from the Baltic Environmental Forum, is the data provided, Climarine, will the spatial information on uncertainty be also provided for download or only the average ensembles or any other aggregation will be provided? Yes, so what we, we took is um, the average, and then we also have maps for the minimum value and the maximum value using uh, from um, uh, from the modeled uh, uh, runs that we have. Because there are a lot of uncertainties built into the different models. There are a lot of uncertainties built into Symphony, uh, part methodologically and part for the data. So we tried to come up with a good way to combine all of these, but it, we couldn't really come up with anything that was understandable to anybody. So we we did it like like this, and we present like the range from the maximum where we think, the minimum where we think, and the, and the average value, which is sort of the approach um, with IPCC um, and um, uh, their climate change. Uh, where you have an ensemble mean of the different well, um, of the different models and a maximum and uh, minimum to get a range of expected changes, we we thought that that was the <laughs> the easiest way to communicate that there is a, quite a wide range in uh, the model predictions, and those will be published uh, later this fall. Thank you, Jonas. I'll be looking forward to see the, those publications, and I think a lot of people will be as well. Um, another question, and we have time for two or three questions left, uh, by Stefan Husa, and I know you already answered this online again, Jonas, but uh, I think it's important to, to for all the participants to hear. Is there a way to find solutions, for example, by building artificial reefs to support blue mussels and in a way build climate refugium? Um, yes, the problem is, uh, I mean, even, even if you build a perfect habitat for a species, if the, if, if the environmental conditions, um, some salinity and temperature change, then the animals can't live there. It goes for all the different animals. So that's that's why these climate refugia sort of uh, ends up where where they are um, because they can't be built or created artificially in any other place, uh, probably. Thank you. And we have two uh, more questions um, by Angela Schultz Seven. Uh, and these, I think, are for both Oscar and Jonas. To what extent have you taken low trophic aquaculture into account as a potential climate mitigation method as algae take up CO2? And there are many studies ongoing on the potential effect of low trophic aquaculture uh, uptake of CO2. I, I can go first. Um, the aquaculture as such is not part of what's in, what's in the package of Symphony. We do have a, a environmental impacts of aquaculture, but we don't have any positive impacts of uh, climate mitigation for, for any of the human activities at the moment. And this is of course, it's something we would like to have, but it's not in the modeling at the moment. Oscar, would you like to add yeah, something? I, yeah, I think it, this is rather a question for, for the climate modeling as such to add to, to, to the scenarios where we have mit mitigation in the uh, hydrological and the nutrient mod modeling. Thank you. So we are reaching the end of our workshop and I would just, and we don't have more questions on the chat. So I would ask a general question to all the speakers. Uh, so in the Baltic Sea, we are, we are 
happily seeing a lot of initiatives to including climate change in marine special planning, but in, unfortunately, this is not the case all over the world. So what do you, would you uh, suggest that should be done to increase the awareness on how urgent it is to include climate change in marine special planning in other areas? And I know this is a tricky question. <laughs> But if, if anyone wants to step in with any comments. I can go first. Uh, I mean, this is down to dissemination through all the marine special planning, like conferences like this one. And also if there are other international um, projects or conferences going on. And for example, the UN bodies like IUC, UNESCO to, to, um, and, and the work that they are doing on international MSB guidance, uh, for example. Thank you. Joaquin? I, I, um, I, I totally agree. This is something we need to talk about and we need to do it now because the kind of change is is happening, so we can't wait for that. Uh, at the same time, we have to be realistic. Uh, it's difficult to predict the climate change. It can be a little bit scary to to deal with it, and uh, and sometimes it's, it seems like a huge, huge issue in MSP. But I would say it's not. I mean, we work with uh, biodiversity at a daily basis. We work with offshore wind, and even sometimes we work with aquaculture, even though not so much in the Baltic Sea, at least in planning, but it might be doing the future. So to, to, to have it at, uh, I mean, we have to present it very in, uh, in a realistic way. Uh, so, uh, and be, be clear that uh, MS, MSP is not, uh, it's not expect, expected to solve the climate change issues. It's just one instrument out of many uh, in the marine management that have to deal with that. So I uh, mean, that kind of message, I think uh, it, it might, be more interesting for others to actually look into it uh, with open eyes. Uh, and actually now there are a lot of plans around, so uh, we can discuss it. Uh, we have a, have a kind of baseline for, for, for this work and maybe also some examples. Thank you. Thank you, Joaquin. Does any of the other speakers want to say any final words? Maybe I okay. can. Uh, uh, at here from the search perspective. So I think dissemination is very, very important, as uh, Iona said, and the experience that we uh, had in the last uh, two years from this collaboration between Alcom and uh, Baltic Earth, the scientist, uh, was very good because then we could really uh, address uh, uh, the, in our discussion the uncertainty aspects because uncertainty is, uh, well, manifold. It has been said already, it's the models, but it's also natural variability, something that we can nothing do about. And this kind of discussion, if we can uh, take this in, on a level that everybody understand what this climate information is about, and that is, for instance, in the form of this climate fact sheet, then it will trigger the awareness, um, the awareness also for other regions, not only the Baltic Sea, but for other coastal uh, seas um, that are also, um, well, under the pressure of, uh, um, yeah, under the anthropogenic pressures. And that will then help really to uh, take the right uh, initiatives, in, in my opinion. So I think openness and uh, fair information about what we really know and what we do not know, because unfortunately, a lot of wrong messages uh, are around about climate change. And I think we should stop that uh, by this kind of uh, discussion. And I'm very happy to be here at this workshop um, to discuss these issues with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marcus, for your final words. And we are uh, on time. So I would like to thank all the speakers and all the participants for being part of this workshop. I think these initiatives, I agree what Marcus and Jonas and Joaquin said, are very important to raise awareness. Uh, we will now have a, a 30 minutes break, and then there will be the workshop recap with summaries from all workshops that took place during the forum. And so thank you so much for the invitation to be here and for all the very nice discussions. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you to everybody and a round of applause to our excellent moderator, Dr. Katrina Frazao Santos. Thank you for making this happen together with all of the speakers. Thank you so much for this thank you. workshop on the crucial topic of MSP and climate change. And uh, thank you also from my side and from the organizers to all the participants on the platform. You are amazing. Uh, I hope that the speakers take, take some time and go through the questions there because there was another world, another discussion going on while, while you are presenting here. So it was amazing to see how we all joined on this platform. So uh, you all were in kind of a way uh, a part of the success of this event. So thank you very much. But ladies and gentlemen, it's not a... Uh, it's not ending right now. We're just closing down the beta stage, but everything will continue on the main stage. As uh, Katrina has already said, there will be a recap of all the uh, workshops on the main stage in 30 minutes. And afterwards, uh, there's going to be a keynote speech and a closing plenary session. So please do attend that. And that is going on right here on this platform in the uh, tab main stage. So please do go there in 30 minutes, uh, be there, and let's continue this form there. Uh, for now, my name is Art Sodolinch, and I wish you a very pleasant day. Goodbye.